Hello everybody, today's talk is Mahfuz and Darwish from National Literature to World Literature. Uh, actually, I delivered uh, a talk on this subject uh, in my participation in the first Congress of the World Literature Association from the 30th of June to the 3rd of July 2011. That was the first academic conference on world literature uh, and it was held in Beijing under the, the title The Rise of World Literature. And uh, actually uh, there were some key scholars uh, participated in that uh, conference uh, like David Damrosh, uh, Spivak and also uh, Professor Zhang Longxi. Uh, and it was very short talk because uh, each scholar was given like uh, 15 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes, something like that. So it was a short talk. But uh, uh, last year I was asked while I was teaching at uh, Lingnan University, I was as asked to give uh, a talk uh, in a um, research seminar series. Um, so I used the same topic, but I developed it. Uh, and uh, the talk was for almost more than one and a half hours, almost two hours. So uh, today's talk will be a little bit long, so I will try to d to divide it into three parts. The first part will, uh, will try to give an introduction, a very brief introduction to world literature. What is world literature? The second part will talk about Mahfuz and his uh, novels uh, and how he how his literature was moved from uh, national uh, literature to be uh, or to become world literature and the same with uh, Mahmoud Darwish in the third part so uh, uh, let me start with the first part world literature what is world literature what do we mean when we say world literature does it mean uh, these uh, international bestsellers books uh, definitely not. Does it mean that uh, books are uh, well accepted uh, around the world? Does it mean that uh, literature that's written in, um, in English, for example? Uh, what do we mean actually by word literature? And what do we mean by national literature? For example, does uh, national literature uh, have to focus on nationalism more than literature? What if uh, there is a novel that really depicts the local life and local culture, but in um, and but in terms of literature, it's not. Uh, we can't really consider it uh, uh, highbrow literature or good literature at all. And uh, what is canonical literature? There are so many questions actually we will uh, will face when we come to think of world literature and national literature and so on. The first time the word the word world literature was used, the first time ever, that was in 1827 by Goethe, the German uh, poet. Uh, Weltliteratur in German. He said national literature is now rather an unmeaning term. The epoch of world literature is at hand. He prophesied the beginning of world, what he called at that time Weltliteratur, or world literature. Uh, the second time it was used, that term was used, was uh, 21 years later, in 1848, in the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels, uh, where they said the international creations of individ individual nations become common property and from the numerous national and local literature there arises a world literature. We can see that uh, from Marx and Engels uh, definition or introduction to world literature or also prophecy of what will be later called as world literature we can we can see that they refer to the to the to the writing or the literature of each nation and uh, and also get a, also his definition or his talk of word literature also falls in the same line that uh, the the sum of of the literature written in any country in any nation or by any nation uh, all this together compromise or make up what 
what later we shall call world literature so is that the idea is uh, i mean the if we read american literature english literature french literature italian uh, and so on and so forth uh, african literature asian chinese does it mean now we know about world literature or this world literature must have some certain uh, some certain um, uh, so, so some certain specifications or features uh, in order to be called world literature um, actually in the towards the end of the of the 20th century and with the beginning of the 21st century century the the interest in world literature uh, was kindled and there there were some scholars around the world uh, especially in the in the western world uh, actually they got interested in in world literature and they wrote books about uh, about it uh, let's let us mention just three of them uh, Franco Moretti uh, and his publication in 2000, David Damrosch, his publication in 2003, and Pascal Casanova. So one from Italy, one from America, one from France. And they, three of them, they, they had different approaches and different understanding, different definition of word uh, literature, completely different, uh, different approaches. Uh, Damrosch established the Journal of World Literature. Uh, and also in uh, in London, London-based Bloomsbury Publishing launched a new book series called the title of the book, whatever the book is, then as word literature. For example, Heart of Darkness as word literature, Things Fall Apart as word literature, and so on. And uh, the idea was to examine this word literature and uh, in terms of production, circulation, and uh, reception, and so on. The reception also is very important. and. Uh, um, what 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 kind of work we we can consider world literature after how many years of uh, publishing that book we can we can see say that this book is really world literature after passing the the test of time in 2003 damrosch published his what is world literature a book called what is world literature in 2008 uh, chia wrote an essay what is a world and then Damrosch wrote, in 2009, wrote another essay called What is Literature? And uh, in 2016, What isn't World Literature? Another essay. And uh, Thornaby in 2016 wrote What not, not in brackets, in brackets, What not World uh, Literature? Uh, Casanova in her book, uh, The World Republic of Letters, the World Republic of Letters that was published in 2004. 2004. She said, the World Republic of Let Letters, the World Republic of Letters, that's the name of her book. Did I say the World Republic of Literature? Uh, she, actually, the title of her book, The World Republic of Letters. She says, I quote, uh, in page 146 from her book, the World Republic of Letters it is plain that translation into French, owing to Paris' unique power of uh, consecration, occupies a special place in the literary world. And the greatest English authors enjoyed truly universal recognition during the 18th and 19th centuries only through the translation of their writings into French. And of course, this is Casanova said so. And actually, she, uh, she, here she sheds light on the importance of translation. The importance of translation. We know that the translation gave rise to comparative literature. And definitely, uh, translation is so important to world literature too. Uh, but how important is it? What if, for example, we read some uh, works in their original language? If I read a work, uh, I'm not an English native speaker, but if I read a novel in English, or if I read a novel in Chinese, or in Russian, even though I am not Chinese and I'm not Russian and so on, does this work, is this work word literature to me? Even here, I don't need translation at all. 
so if we say translation is so important uh, to word literature is it that important what is what if I read the the word in its uh, original language right away without directly without uh, any need for translation um, Moretti Franco Moretti in 2000 he advocated what he called distant reading distant reading with the West as the center and the non-West as distant lands distant something that reminds of reminds us of the the lot uh, of Edward Said's the other it's us and the other and uh, so the the West in the center and the other the non-West distant reading so he uh, as well, distant lands the, the West is in the center and the non-West as distant lands so he called it distant reading um, the, these three scholars they apply three different uh, methodologies and three different approaches for example both Moretti and Casanova they both they both used sociological approaches uh, sociological methodology while Damrosch used humanistic uh, methodology uh, historical investigation and uh, close text textual analysis uh, Damrosch defined word literature as I quote uh, a mode of reading, a mode of reading, uh, a form of detached engagement with words beyond our own place and time. Uh, it's so somehow it's close also to what Moretti called distant reading. Uh, you are in the West and you read literature of distant lands so it's distant uh, readings and here uh, Damrosch say it's a detached a form of detached engagement with worlds beyond our own place and time uh, and actually he wrote a, an excellent wonderful book uh, called Gilgamesh on the the, the, the epic Gilgamesh so it's not only beyond our place but also beyond our time uh, so, word literature, do we only mean mainly Western literature? Western literature read by, read and translated by Western, by non-Western uh, readers and uh, non-Western writers. Uh, <clears throat> what Damrosch and Moretti said earlier uh, actually goes again goes against that because it's not only Western literature that should be considered world literature but and also it's the it's the same meaning of what uh, uh, Goethe and uh, and Marx and Engels said before that uh, the writing of each nation if we take the canonical literature of each nation the sum of all this writing uh, can be considered world uh, literature so it's not we or we and we should we should not look at western literature only as world literature no it should go beyond that so damrosh redefined the center periphery relationship between the west and the rest of the world in terms of translation and reading and uh, he uh, shed light here on the importance of translation that translation adds meaning and gives meaning extra meaning extra dimension to the original text and that the text the original text gains in translation uh, we may also ask about the difference between comparative literature and world literature well comparative literature we can tell from the title it focuses more on comparison comparison between uh, take different texts from different uh, languages um, David Damrosch says world literature is the body of texts that gains in translation so here Damrosch puts a great importance on translation for the word although the although without translation the work will not be word will not be word literature um, of course translation is so important translation indeed give rise to, to word uh, literature and to comparative uh, literature uh, too 
So uh, translation is so important whether you read it in the original language or you read it translated. But uh, for other people, for the, the mainstream, uh, translation will be uh, important to them, important for them to read the text. Calvino, Italo Calvino, he says, a classic is a text that has never stopped saying what it has to say. If we uh, have to uh, define what classics are and what canonical works are, uh, this definition is, is very interesting, that uh, a classic is a text that has never stopped saying what it has to say. In each generation, there is something uh, new we may discover in the, in the classics. Uh, so, in other words, classics really, they passed the, the test of time. They, uh, there are some works that they, they are famous only and get uh, popularity only in, uh, in a short span of time during a certain time. After that time, then it's, it's not famous anymore, nobody cares for it. Damrush says in, in his book, uh, What is World Literature in 2003, in page 6, he says, a work enters into world literature by a double process. First, by being read as literature. So it has to be considered literature first. The first thing, it, it should be literature by being read as literature. Second, by circulating out into a broader world beyond its linguistic and cultural point of origin. As it moves into the sphere of world literature, far from inevitably, inevitably suffering a loss of authenticity or essence, a work can gain in many ways. So while the work uh, in translation loses some uh, some of its uh, merits and values in, in, in the original language, it also gains some other merits and values uh, in translation. Uh, to understand the workings of world literature, we need more a phenomenology than an ontology on the work of art. In the same book, in the introduction uh, written by Schildigen, Schildigen says, and instead of perceiving world literature as isolated books on the shelf, Damrosh considers world literature as texts that travel, texts that assume new lives, and texts that manifest differently in different geocultural contexts. In other words, to understand world literature is no longer to understand the sum total of all na national masterpieces, but to understand how a work of art is opened up and reshaped by a world literary cultural exchange network. So what, uh, what Damrosh wants to say here, it's not enough just to read works in different, uh, different languages or written by different uh, people from different cultures. Uh, it, what, what is important is to understand how this work is opened up, reshaped by a literary, uh, a world literary cultural exchange network. How it's circulated, uh, and why the why the people liked it in different uh, nations. Uh, I I remember in 2006, I think, or 2005, there was uh, uh, the man, the International Man Lit Literature Festival, the Hong Kong International Man Literature F Festival, if I still remember the name correctly. And uh, one of the, the key guests uh, invited was uh, Toby Eden. Toby Eden, uh, one of the most famous literary agents uh, in the UK. He tells his story of how he published The Wild Swan that he said that one day a Chinese lady came into his office, offered him the manuscript of the Wild Swan. He read the manuscript and he liked it, and he decided to to, pub, to find a way to publish it to, to, as an agent. And uh, uh, of course, the, it was written by a Chinese lady, so in terms of the language, it was not ready yet. So uh, he gave it to uh, an English editor to work on it. Uh, after the first editor, finished his work, uh, Toby Eden still didn't like the, the final outcome. He gave it to a second editor, 
and still after finishing his work on editing and everything still didn't he was not happy with the with the outcome he gave it to a third edi editor and then a fourth editor a fifth editor he said six editors worked on the manuscript <coughs> only after the the work of the sixth editor was he satisfied with the outcome and he started to to approach publishers to uh, to publish the book the book was published first in england and then america and but it was not successful at all in england at the beginning and it was not successful in america uh, either but when he published it in uh, in australia it became <coughs> national bestseller in Australia right away. And that drew the attention of the English and American readers who started to read the book again and influenced by the success in Australia, they were, uh, they got, they received that influence and they, they liked the book and the book became international bestseller. This tells us how uh, editing is so important and how one the success of the book in in one part of the world can influence the, the uh, other parts of the world this is exactly the same also with arabian nights arabian nights in the arab world was not considered really uh, uh, you know a highbrow literature at all because it was written in a language that's not uh, eloquent uh, but when it was translated into french first and it became what we now call international bestseller and then it was translated later into in Italian and English <coughs> and other languages uh, European languages and that drew the the Arabs attention to Arabian Nights and they started to read it again and they started to discover its merits and the literary values they and almost almost all or most of the great uh, novelists in our modern time were influenced one way or another by the Arabian Nights. <clears throat> So it's so important not just to read uh, a text in, uh, in its original language or translated, but it's important also to see how it was uh, read in different, uh, in different parts of the world and uh, how the success of that book in one part of the world influenced its success in other parts. Uh, Zhang Longxi, uh, Professor Zhang Longxi, uh, he wrote an essay called The United Nations of World Literature, The United Nations of Great Books, in, uh, in, in which he poses the question how to decide what canonical works are. And uh, he also poses another question, should the canonical work be representative of its time or different from its time? Like Du Fu's poetry, for example, the great uh, Chinese uh, poetry, who was called poet historian because he described in his poetry all the great historical events uh, of his time. Uh, <clears throat> so the, in order to, to consider a book canonical, should it be representative of its time or not? We will come to this point and we'll see this point clearly when we discuss the works of uh, Nagib Mahfouz because some of his works are really uh, um, excellent uh, depiction of uh, the Egyptian society and Egyptian uh, uh, life, especially uh, uh, of the beginning of the 20th century. The beginning of the 20th century, that society, Mahfouz described it perfectly and also the second part of the, of the word literature. So uh, actually when we speak of word literature there are other uh, factors that should be taken into consideration like uh, translation, uh, political, uh, social, cultural uh, factors. All this should be taken into account to see why a certain book uh, should be considered world literature while another book uh, should not. And uh, so we need a, con a continued re-evaluation re -evaluation of the literary output and its translation uh, in order to define all the factors uh, behind it. Um, <clears throat> so translation is, uh, now I'm trying to wrap up uh, the, this uh, talk, translation is the primary path. First, as, as Damrush said, that the first two process, the first process, the first thing is to consider it literature, to read it as literature. The second is 
to be translated and to see how it was <coughs> spread in the uh, circulated in the world world literature is writing that gains in translation as david damush uh, said uh, <coughs> world literature in national language uh, to demonstrate national identity and culture in world literature to the extent that national literature can affect world literature. Uh, the example of Nagi Mahfouz again is an excellent example. He depicted national uh, issues, um, uh, depicted the life in Egypt, described everything local, the cultural local, but through that national literature he gained world recognition. So he, uh, he demonstrated this national identity and national culture uh, in his world literature. And also national literature as world literature, such as, for example, uh, such as African world literature, Chinese world literature, Arabic world literature. This national literature here refers to the writers who write in the language of their resident countries writing of the, of the like for example the chinese writers chinese american writers who uh, write in english or uh, indian american writers uh, or indians who live in 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 england or wherever african writers living ab abroad and they write in western languages but they write about national issues they write about the Chinese society, the African society, the Indian society, and so on and so forth, uh, but in a different language. So, is it good enough for this to be to be considered for these works to be considered world literature? I mean, is it is it enough for these works to be written in Western language to be considered world literature? Um, this is also another uh, thing that we we should uh, consider when we when we talk about uh, world literature. But of course, uh, I very much agree with uh, David Damrosh that the, the first process should be, the text should be read as literature. I mean, it should be considered really literature, good quality of literature, in order to, to we take it to the second level, because there are so many works that were really distributed around the world and they gained a, a great success and international bestsellers, but they are not literature at all. And everybody knows that. I don't, I don't need really to, to explain it. So finally, to finish part one of this talk, what is national literature? There are so many questions we raised uh, and it's difficult sometimes to find a, a, a clear-cut answer. What is national literature? What is world literature? Is literature defined by its language or by its the, the nationality of the author or by the, uh, the the location of its publication? If I may take myself as an example, I'm originally from Egypt, but I wrote three novels in English, and those novels were, read, uh, were published in Hong Kong. So, how should I consider these three novels? Are they Egyptian literature? But they are not in Arabic. And uh, even though the first novel <coughs> set in Cairo, the second and the third novels set in China and Hong Kong and uh, the third novel part of it in, in Cairo also. So sh should I consider it Egyptian uh, literature or Arabic literature just because I am Egyptian? Or should I consider it English literature because they were written in English? Or should I consider, consider them Hong Kong literature because they were published in Hong Kong with the support of ADC Arts Development Council, which is uh, similar to the uh, Ministry of Culture uh, in other countries? It's very difficult to, to, to really to consider, to, to call it, to, uh, to, is it Egyptian, Ch uh, Chinese, Hong Kong, uh, English, uh, or is it, it depends on the theme or the language or the national, national, nationality of the writer or what. Does national literature reflect more nationalism than literature or does it have to reflect na more nationalism than literature? And what if the national language changed over time? So in some countries, the national language itself changes. So here, 
shall we consider the language written before that change, that change, still national literature or what? It changed from its uh, local language to English, for example, taking English as a formal language. So shall we consider li literature written in English? Uh, English literature or Indian or Chinese or Singaporean, Malaysian, what? Is world literature the literature that travels across cultures? Uh, this also, this point, uh, Damrosh focused on this point. Is it just the literature that travels across culture? What if this literature is not is not really up to the the standards, the the required standards? Not really good literature. So this should not be really uh, the main criterion. Uh, what makes a particular text national literature and another text world literature? Uh, I talked about this uh, point. Is the idea of world literature conceivable without translation? Is um, is it conceivable at all without translation? And as I said earlier, what if I read a book in English right away? Should I consider, for me as a reader, should I consider it word literature? It's definitely word literature. If I read Shakespeare in English, Charles Dickens in English, they are word literature, even if I read them in English. But for this text to be considered world literature or to to enter the the realm of world literature they have to be translated first and to be read around the world uh, so translation is is something we it seems that we we can't do without it we can't do without translation translation gave rise to comparative literature translation gave rise to world literature translation gave rise to some civilization translation the translation of rosetta stone gave rise to the egyptian the ancient egyptian civilization and the to a depiction deciphering the deciphering of the the hier uh, hieroglyphic language and uh, from then on we discover that there was something called egyptian uh, civilization that has literature and, and and stories and poetry and such a wonderful trans translation is so uh, important uh, and we can't do without it uh, this is the end of the first part of the lecture as i said it's quite long and i will keep talking now uh, but I'll give you a break and I will start in part two right away. See you soon. Hello everybody with part two of uh, our uh, talk on uh, world literature and now we'll talk about Mahfuz in the second part and Darwish in the third part. Uh, so in this part I, uh, uh, on, on Nagib Mahfuz, uh, actually uh, I will try to show that how Mahfuz and in part three how Darwish, both of them, how they uh, initially achieved international fame by addressing national issues in their fiction and poetry. And the development also, I also focus on the, and show you the development of their writing and style and themes from national to uh, universal. We'll start with Nagib Mahfouz. Nagib Mahfouz won the Nobel Prize in uh, 1988 and he said, I had always suspected that the Nobel was a Western Prize. I thought they would never select an Eastern writer. This is in his uh, interview, uh, interviewed by Charles El Shabrawi in the Paris Review, uh, issue number 129. In, Actually, there are other writers who, uh, who also uh, Arab uh, Egyptian writers who really deserved to win Nobel Prize. If they were living in our time, I think they should they should have won it uh, right away. And it's really a mystery how how they didn't win. Uh, Nagi Mahfouz definitely deserved to win it. De definitely deserved to be the first. Uh, Arab ever to win this uh, prize, but he was not the only one. There are also Tawfiq al-Hakim, there is Yusuf Idris, and Yusuf Idris always thought that he deserved it. He, he even said that somebody called him and told him, told him that he was selected to win the prize, and he was shocked later on uh, to know that it was uh, Mahfouz uh, who was selected. Anyhow, after uh, 1988, after Mahfouz won the Nobel Prize, the uh, translation of uh, Arabic literature increased a lot and uh, around the world and uh, 
the world started to notice Arabic uh, literature and uh, many of them gained international success even more than what Nagim Mahfouz uh, gained and uh, some of these books I will not give examples okay even though I have prepared some examples but I don't want to, to give examples but um, many works gained international uh, success and international fame and they sold more copies even more than uh, Nagi Mahfouz novels but in terms of literature are they good literature is this the, the right lit literature that really represents modern Arabic literature? This is the question that we need to, to ask and we need to, to consider uh, seriously. Because many of them really lack literary merit. Uh, the literary merit of the, the Egyptian writers who didn't, of their works, who didn't win those who didn't win the Nobel Prize, like as I said, uh, Tawfiq al-Hakim, Yusuf Idris, uh, they both deserve to win the, that prize. And their works are far better, far better, especially Tawfiq al-Hakim, especially Tawfiq al-Hakim, his works far better than uh, the, the, the literary merits in, and values in his works, far better than the modern and contemporary uh, Arabic uh, works. So actually this uh, international bestseller is not a criterion at all uh, for good quality of, of literature. And uh, exactly same as the Arabian Nights, I, I used that example in my first part, I don't want to repeat it again, but the Arabian Nights actually uh, was not considered literature uh, among the Arabs until it gained f uh, fame uh, in the West and uh, so translation here we can look at translation as misrepresentation of literature it's a misrepresentation of literature because when it was translated into french uh, italian english it was translated into eloquent language when in arabic language it's it, it's not written in eloquent arabic at all it's full of slang full of slang and full of uh, foul language and everything so that's why we we don't recommend it uh, or some parts of it we don't recommend it to uh, to young uh, kids to read so sometimes translation is really a misrepresentation of literature um, Nagi Mahfouz uh, in an interview said I found some motives in the Arabian Nights some motives and as i said in part one the success of this arabian nights in in europe uh, just uh, uh, attracted and drew the attention of arab arabic writers arab writers to read it and to learn from it not only the arab writers writers around the world actually so he says thus i wrote my arabian nights and dates his arabian nights and days he he wrote it uh, influenced by the Arabian Nights. Um, J.M. Uh, Curti, he, he characterized Mahfouz as a fabulous straight out of the Arabian Nights. And although this is his only influence and but I myself don't agree with uh, with him in saying so Edward Said also didn't uh, agree with him and also Elias El Khouri didn't agree with uh, with him uh, so Edward Said didn't agree that w with uh, could see that Mahfouz was just the outcome of of Ara uh, Arabian Nights and uh, Elias El Khouri and Edward Said they both regard Mahfouz novel as and here I quote uh, uh, Elias Al Khouri saying, it's history of the novel form. The writings of Mahfouz is the history of the novel form, from historical fiction to the romance, saga, and uh, picaresque tale, followed by works in realist, modernist, naturalist, symbolist, absurdist modes, uh, end of quotes. And indeed, when we read uh, the, the complete works of Nagib Mahfouz, we find that uh, he didn't leave a style that he didn't try. He tried his hand at everything and he uh, he really uh, he, he was a, a man of genius. He was ingenious uh, and uh, reading him in Arabic or in English or any language you, you you will discover and you will find out that straight away. So now let us talk about Nagi Mahfouz. Uh, Nagi Mahfouz was born on the 11th of December 19 
11N. He passed away on the 30th of August 2006. Uh, he, in his writing, I will, I will show you how his writing moves from national being national to being universal in terms of theme. In terms of theme, he focused at the beginning on the history of ancient Egypt, and then after that on the history of modern uh, Egypt. In terms of writing mode, he started with the historical realist narrative, then moved to social realist narrative, and then to modernist narrative, and I will give you examples uh, now. The, the first example, I would divide his uh, phases of writing his uh, career into different different phases. The first is the from 1939 when he started writing to 1944. Uh, he focused on national themes and on ancient e Egypt, on the uh, the history of ancient Egypt, and uh, the the mode of writing he used was historical realism. So he published three novels. The first is called Abath al Aqdar. Abath al Aqdar in Arabic, the, the literal translation, the mockery of fate in 1939, and then Radubis, uh, it's a name of a girl in 1943. Then uh, Kifah Tiba, Kifah Tiba, uh, Thebes struggle in 1944. And the, in the three no novels, uh, the main idea was independence from the from foreign foreign, uh, especially especially Kifah Tiba, uh, independence from foreign uh, armies and foreign nations. And here, these novels also, they were published when when Egypt itself was still under the British occupation. So he was like uh, uh, trying to awaken his own people to, uh, to the importance of being liberated uh, and being, uh, to become independent from the oppressing uh, British uh, occupation. So the, uh, at that time also the nationalism, the spirit of nationalism and what was called pharaonism was so high and this this is very clear in these three novels by Nagi Mahfouz that uh, so many Egyptians at that time they focused on their identity as pharaohs and they belong to pharaohs and even some of them they said we are not Arabs uh, of course in terms of the the blood lineage yes Egyptian are somehow different from from Arabs even though the mother of Arabs was Egyptian Hagar was Egyptian uh, but in terms of culture uh, Egyptians are Arabs in terms of culture because after accepting Islam uh, we accepted the Arabic language or let us say the Arabic language gradually was imposed on the, on the Egyptians until it replaced the ancient Egyptian, the, the Coptic language but uh, whatever historically happened the, the outcome is that the, the, we use the Arabic language in our writing, in the way we speak in our Egyptian way but still uh, uh, Arabic, colloquial uh, Arabic. Uh, so in terms of culture, Egyptians are Arabs. In terms of the, the, the blood lineage, it's, uh, we are not Arabs. We should draw attention, we should draw a line between these uh, differences. So, Abath al Aqdar uh, was called uh, in English, was published under the name of Khufu, Khufu's Wisdom. Khufu is the, the great king who, who ordered the build of building the big uh, pyramids. Uh, Radubis was published under the title Radubis of Nubia. So, uh, Abath al-Aqdar or Khufu's wisdom, it's, uh, it's about resisting fate and the inevitable destiny. It's uh, about uh, a king who uh, a sorcerer told him that a new boy uh, would be born and he would be the king and that none of your children will be, will, will, will be the king after you, will inherit your uh, throne. So he ordered the killing of all newly born uh, boys. So his vizier, his minister, uh, many, he had a son uh, born and he managed to 
give that uh, boy to to somebody to to let him escape the kingdom and that boy was raised up in a different part of a different land and then he in the end he he really became a king so here Mahf was trying to say that resisting fate is useless and the uh, fate will happen no matter how much we resist it so and there is divine wisdom in fate there is divine wisdom in accepting fate. Uh, radu peace is um, also about surrendering to one's fate radu peace about surrendering and accepting uh, one's fate uh, uh, the struggle of Th Thebes uh, was published in English under Thebes at War, and uh, it's about Ohmos. Ohmos, who was the at that time Egypt was occupied by the Hoxos, and there were like two kingdoms: the Northern Kingdom and the su Southern Kingdom. The, no the Southern Kingdom was referred to as Upper. Uh, Egypt and uh, the northern kingdom was referred to as lower Egypt so the lower Egypt in the north was occupied by Hoxos the higher Egypt in the south was free and uh, uh, and uh, Ahmos uh, managed to to, uh, to, uh, to have to build an army and to free Egypt liberate Egypt from the Hoxos but the, the story is about ah Ahmos before doing all of that he fell in love with a girl from the Hexos and that girl was a princess she was the daughter of the Hexos king and he was tormented of course uh, between his love to that girl and his love of his country uh, <clears throat> and again the, the story is is also uh, sheds light on some problems of the past and uh, the present in Egypt at that time um, if we move to the second phase of his writing, beginning from, we said the first phase from 1939 to 1945, the second from 45 to 47, and here he moved from writing uh, on ancient Egypt to writing on modern Egypt, describing modern Egypt. And uh, again, his uh, writing more changed from historical realism to social realism. So he published three books, uh, the first called Al Qahir al Jadida, Al Qahir al Jadida, Cairo Modern, and the second Khan al Khalili. Khan al Khalili is uh, a local market in the heart of Cairo, the old Cairo, and then Zukak al Madak, again, it's Madak Ali, it's a name of Ali, uh, published in 1947. Khan al Khalili in 46 and Cairo Modern in 45. And they were published under uh, uh, in English under these titles Cairo Modern, Khan al Khalili, and Midak uh, Ali. Uh, these uh, three novels vividly describe the life of poor people in the early years of the 20th uh, century. Uh, they really describe the local culture and the, the life of, uh, I will not say the middle class people, maybe that time there was no, at that time there was no real middle class, uh, substantial middle class, but the life of the poor people uh, in the early years of the 20th century. So the, the individual individual's tragedy in each novel is a representation and a reflection of the society's tragedy, the tragedy faced by the whole uh, society. And of course, uh, uh, in these three novels, we'll always find the battle, the ongoing battle between good and evil. And uh, there is also criticism of uh, political, uh, social, economical, uh, and cultural environment. Uh, and in this novel, novels, the three novels, Mahfuz used the stream of consciousness and indirect descriptive uh, narrative uh, focusing on time and uh, place. Uh, he, uh, in Cairo modern, in al qahira al-Gadida, there were three main characters in this novel. The, each one of them represents one type of people or young people lived in the in, in Cairo uh, in the early years of the 20th century and the, the th four of them were uh, uh, university students so the, the first one was religious and he believed that religion 
should be the foundation and uh, the essence of all our ethical codes. The second one believed in social justice and in the struggle that uh, the struggle in, he believed in a struggle uh, to achieve social equality. So we can tell that the first one was Isla Islamist, the second one was socialist. The third one believed in uh, in his own or in one's own benefits. So he was uh, Machiavell Machiavellian. Um, he just uh, he's after his own benefits. The first, the fourth, the fourth one was a passive observer. Passive observer. Whatever will happen, will happen. And uh, one of the main uh, character uh, in this novel is called Mahmoud Abdel Daim. Mahmoud Abdel Daim, that uh, Machiavellian, uh, I quote what he said in the novel. He said, in fact, any regime would turn into dictatorship if applied in Egypt. So from this quote, we know right away that Mahfuz is not telling us a story or a tale just to entertain us, but is always criticizing the political regime at the time. In another uh, part of the novel, he said, uh, Mahmoud Abdel Daim, uh, pickpocketing is a magical art. A pickpocket owns what is in people's pockets. And the rulers of this country know this principle very well. So uh, we can see the, the sharp critique of uh, the political uh, situation at the time. In 1948, we're still with the national uh, theme, but, and we're still with the, the modern Egypt, describing modern Egypt. Uh, all his novels after that were about modern Egypt, except later on, uh, I will come to this point to explain what novel he, he used, ancient Egypt as a theme. But in this novel that's called uh, as sarab the Mirage, he used a different mode of writing, a psychological realism. Psychological realism. Ka Kamil, the, the protagonist, he said in the novel, I realized that I will never attain happiness and that that desire to escape will never leave me. But where to escape this time? Kamel was uh, raised by his mother. Uh, his mother was divorced when he was young and uh, she took uh, meticulous care of him. Uh, that uh, uh, he was dependent on her uh, in everything until he was uh, 25 years old. Uh, he, he, he slept in the same bed, he shared the same bed with his mother. Um, so he couldn't break away from, from his mother and he decided, in order to break away from her, he decided to marry uh, a girl he thought he loved. But uh, he was so nervous that he thought that uh, he, uh, uh, he couldn't have a an, an normal, natural uh, sexual relationship with her and uh, he he saw a doctor and the doctor told him that he was fine it's just a psychological problem and uh, he started to try to find his happiness somewhere else by knowing some uh, prostitutes and he was fine and in terms in comes to bed he was fine with uh, with prostitutes but uh, anyhow his wife died uh, suddenly and then his mother and uh, in another part here I say but where to escape I wish I could be created and you to become someone healthy in body and soul with no fear or rudeness someone who would dive into the sea of human life without fear or uh, aversion so uh, actually it's a person who is in search of happiness uh, without finding it no matter where he searched with and it's uh, so it's a, a psychological study a psycho a very interesting without when i say psychological study i don't want to put you off or, or to say that uh, the novel is boring or anything and full of psychological terms not at all not not at all it's very interesting novel uh, and as i said psychological realism so it's interesting as a novel and whether even if you don't get anything psychological out of it or in it, you will still be able to enjoy it as a novel in its own merit. In 1949, he published another great novel, one of his masterpieces uh, called Bidaya wa Nihaya, The Beginning and the End. Also modern Egypt, set in modern Egypt and the writing mode, uh, social realism. 
This novel also, uh, the, the main protagonist, Hassanin, who was Machiavellian, very selfish person, he said, I quote, he who gives in to fate will encourage it to continue doing injustice. And uh, the novel is talking about a poor family moving to a small flat in the basement level. Why? After the death of the uh, of the father or the head of the family, uh, there is no no one to take care of the family, and so the family had to move to a small flat in the basement. And this is a, again, it's another critique of the social system of the time. That social system at the time, when the the head of the family dies, there is nobody to take care of the the rest of the family. And after that, uh, writing and publishing that novel, indeed the Egyptian government. Uh, uh, introduced new scheme to take care of the poor family who have nobody to take care of them and uh, there is a scene at the beginning of uh, the novel when they were moving into that small uh, family and uh, b because of the hardship they faced the mother uh, she had three boys and one girl uh, the mother had to sell her furniture one piece after another and one of the pieces she sold was a big mirror and while the two workers were carrying together carrying the mirror outside the living room uh, the living room uh, Mahfuz says that the mirror uh, reflected the ceiling and while she while the mirror reflected the ceiling and while the two workers were moving of course the the, the mirror uh, shook and the ceiling the, the mother saw the ceiling in the mirror and she saw the the ceiling of her new home was shaking as though there was an earthquake a magnificent scene and it it shows that now without the head of the of the family without her husband now uh, alone uh, taking responsibility or to take care of the family the whole family she feels like the death of the head of the family is like an earthquake that happened to that family and uh, one of the characters Hassanin the youngest guy the youngest brother he was so selfish that uh, uh, the elder brother he didn't continue studying in order to and worked in order to but worked in illegal stuff like selling uh, drugs and so on uh, in, in order to to pay for his school and his uh, the second elder brother he had to work somewhere in another uh, city and to send the money from uh, now and then from time to time and his sister also the, she learned how to sew clothes and to work in some uh, houses but again she uh, she she, she was turned into a, a prostitute later on again to to give him money so he was the only one who continued uh, studying in school and everybody was pay, giving him money and paying for his studies yet he was so ungrateful to all of them and he was so selfish and he only focused on marrying a rich girl and to join the the police academy and he only cared about his prestige and uh, social prestige uh, he thought he and then later on the at the end of the novel the police uh, station a police officer called him and told him that there is a girl they caught a girl a prostitute and uh, she claimed that she was his uh, sister and he went to the police station and really saw his sister there so uh, he felt so ashamed uh, and indeed it's a great shame of course but uh, while he was walking and she was walking behind him i read to you that scene i read uh, i quoted to you in english he thought he would do it right after they had left the police station do it meaning to kill her he decided to kill her because she brought shame to the family and she brought shame to him personally his his interest is in his own uh, social prestige uh, he thought he would do it right after they had left the police station she expected that too overwhelmed with indignation he could feel her presence behind him and could hear her footsteps like bullets piercing his back and uh, in order to relieve him of uh, this dilemma she herself uh, climbed she herself uh, climbed the the sorry there is my telephone she herself climbed the 
the fence of the the bridge on the Nile River and she jumped into the Nile River and he when people managed to get her out and she was dead and uh, someone asked him if he knew that girl and he said no I don't I don't know her he felt he felt so uh, he was he felt ashamed of of himself he, he felt that he was so little and he started to remember uh, her uh, her words and how she sacrificed herself to for his education for him to be educated and he himself uh, jumped into the Nile river and uh, killed himself in uh, 1956 and 1957 uh, these two years witnessed the masterpieces uh, the signature of Nagim Mahfouz his uh, uh, Cairo trilogy uh, again it's modern Egypt and social realism and I say these three novels uh, better than any book of history you would read about Egypt in that describes Egypt in that um, part of uh, of history, meaning the the early years of the 20th century. Reading these three novels would give the reader uh, a perfect uh, picture uh, of how Egypt looked like and how the Egyptian people and Egyptian society was in that time. Uh, so uh, it provides uh, accounts of the patriarchal society to the extent that the, the head of the family was called Ahmed Abdel Jawad and his wife always referred to him and called him as Si Sayyid. Si here meaning master or sir, sir, let's say sir. And uh, Sayyid is the uh, meaning master. So uh, Sayyid Ahmed Abdel Jawad, his name was Sayyid Ahmed Abdel Jawad and she always called him Sir, Sir Master, Sir as Sayyid, Sis Sayyid, Sir. And until now, Nagim Mahfouz really, it's uh, because he created that character, he made it uh, a character of flesh and blood and a real character, realistic character. So uh, until now we still refer to this patriarchal uh, person, any patriarchal person as Sis Said, the person who, who tries to dominate uh, women around him, we, uh, we call that person Sis Said. Uh, and also the, the novel depicts uh, the social and political development in Egypt during that part uh, of history, in its history. In 59, another novel Another great novel came out and it's called Awlad Haritna, Awlad Haritna, Children of the Ali in 1959, for which he, he, won, uh, he won the Nobel Prize. But I think it's really very unfair, very unfair to Nagib Mahfouz to say that he got that Nobel Prize for that novel because I don't see it the best of his writing at all, at all. There are at least uh, at least ten or fifteen or even twenty novels more important and much better than this, uh, much better written by this uh, novel. Uh, but anyhow, uh, here we moved from national theme to this is the first let us let us say the first uh, points where he shifts shifted from the national theme to universal uh, theme. So he uh, he described the pre-modern Egypt, not the modern Egypt, pre-modern Egypt, and uh, its allegorical representation, and it's written, the narrative is a modernist narrative. And it's an allegorical account of the history of the ancient world, from the beginning from the story of, from Adam, from the story of creation, from Adam until our modern time. Uh, and in the end, at the end of the novel, a character called Arfa will kill his grandfather, who is Gabalawi. And now I will explain to you the meanings and the symbols of each name in order to know what he means exactly. So, because Arfa here is actually the science, and Gabalawi is God. So it's like in our time we don't need need religion. We need. Uh, science. Uh, people, some people understood it this way even though Nagi Mahfouz said I didn't mean that and that's why uh, some uh, some uh, fanatic uh, Muslim uh, fanatics really uh, 
called him non-Muslim kafir and one of them, one a young guy attacked him later on crazy. Of course, it's really madness. Uh, so Gabalawi, Gabalawi, the main character, the grandfather, Gabalawi. Gabalawi is from the word Gibilla, meaning, meaning the nature or uh, yeah it's like nature so Gabalawi here and also coming from the word Gabal which is mountain so anyhow referring to, to strength and power so Gabalawi is God in the in the novel and then Adham his son Adham as we can tell Adham referring to Adam you can you can feel if you, even if you are not Arab you can you can hear the 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 similarity in the sound Adam Adam Idris Idris another character Idris is Satan Idris in Arab Satan in Arabic is Iblis so Idris is actually Iblis meaning Satan Umayma 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 coming from the words Umma Umma meaning mother so Umayma is Eve Adam is Adam Umayma is Um, meaning Eve, the mother, our mother. Then Galil, Galil is the Archangel Gabriel. You can, you can tell the closeness in the sound. Then Gabal, Gabal meaning mountain, referring to Sinai mountain, on which uh, Moses talk, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, talk to God. So Gabal is Moses. And Gabal also, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a symbol of strength and power. Uh, so uh, and to be solid. Rifa'a, Rifa'a is Jesus. Why? Because the word Rifa'a from Rifa'a, from being ascended or uh, being lifted up from being uh, from highness itself. The word highness. So Rifa'a. So Jesus here. It's Jesus because he was ascended, ascended to heaven, uh, according to our uh, Islamic faith. Then Qasim, Qasim is Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, uh, because he was nicknamed uh, Abu Qasim, uh, the father of Qasim. So the word Qasim, the character Qasim here is referring, actually refers to Muhammad. Then Arafa, Arafa meaning uh, it's knowledge. Arafa from Ma'rifa meaning knowledge. So Arafa, the magician in the novel, is actually science, and what Mahfuz wants to say that science uh, will prevail in the in our society is what we need in our society. Uh, but he didn't say that on the expense of the religion, whatever his intention was. Then he, in 1961 until 1965, he continued with these universal themes and he returned to talk about modern Egypt. Uh, he used naturalism in his writing, uh, existentialist uh, questions. He posed some existentialist questions and uh, the narrative he used was modern, modernist narrative. The novel was called The Thief and the Dogs, Allah Wal Kilab, another masterpiece. Uh, of Mahmoud Darwish. Saeed Mahran is the, the main character, the protagonist. He seeks revenge from all those who betrayed him. And it's said that this story is in, was inspired by a true story. And uh, he, he talks in this novel about opportunism in the society in, the, in Egypt at that time and about the absurdity of life when everybody around him betrayed him. Almost everybody. Uh, and then he wrote another novel, uh, actually uh, a few novels he wrote depicting the same thing, universal themes set in modern Egypt and he used, more for mode of writing, he used uh, modernist narratives and also naturalism and he posed existential, uh, existentialist questions. The second novel was Autumn Quail, as Simmanuel Kharif. Uh, in nine, published in 1962. Uh, it portrays a former Wafdist, one from the Waft. Waft is a political party that was the ruling party before 1952, uh, the main party, I mean, and uh, main political party. And But after the 1952, the military coup in 1952, uh, that was, some people call it revolution, whatever you call it. Anyhow, he was neg neglected and he didn't find a job for himself and he didn't find any uh, merit or value or importance f for himself to do in life. Uh, 
So he started to search for the meaning of uh, of life in general, not only the meaning of his life. His name, the main character uh, protagonist, is called Isa at the Bar. He says in the novel, "Whatever we do, will remain jobless because we have no role to play. This is why we feel exiled, just like an appendix." Uh, he felt himself to be jobless or to be uh, worthless and he wished Egyptians to travel away to emigrate to other parts of the world words, uh, especially to South America uh, and he said indignant he said Egyptians are reptiles not birds Egyptians are uh, reptiles he wished Egyptians to be like birds and travel abroad but he said Egyptians were reptiles not birds uh, because he dreamed of having uh, a national uh, or uh, he dreamed of ha having a radical uh, change uh, in the society uh, but nothing of that happened uh, of course uh, in 1965, he published another novel, great novel called The Beggar, a Shahad, and uh, it's about a successful lawyer who who is married to a beautiful uh, woman who loves him so much, but uh, he was so unhappy, and uh, he tried to find happiness somewhere else. He searched for the meaning of life uh, first through visiting nightclubs and knowing uh, prostitutes and but uh, nothing nothing gave him happiness brought him happiness and in the end he turned to mysticism and he almost lost his uh, mind so it's a it's a wonderful novel and again it uh, poses existentialist questions about the meaning of life um, and uh, happiness uh, another one this is here the uh, the three novels were published in one book the bigger in english i mean uh, the bigger and the thief and the dogs and the awesome quails and in these three novels we can f we can see there is a sense of estrangement overwhelming the the protagonist in the three novels all of them they search for something whether it's happiness or meaning of their life or uh, value for themselves or home or what they were searching of uh, of something uh, let's say search for, for a home a home in their own ways and in their own different interpretations so uh, all of them existentialist questions raised by the protagonist in the novels in 64 another magnificent novel it's called at tariq the search literally the at tariq meaning the way the path it's like the the taoist way the way in english it's, it was published under the the search because the the protagonist was in search of his father the protagonist called sabir sayyid sayyid ar rahimi sabir literally means patient so he was patient in his search because throughout the whole novel he was searching for his father who uh, uh, whom he never met uh, only his mother told him you about his father your father named so and so um, Sayyid meaning master, so his name patient, then Sayyid Sayyid Ar Rahimi, Ar Rahimi uh, meaning uh, from mercy, it's meaning the merciful. <clears throat> but so actually, his father here existed, but and he was in search of his father, but actually, he didn't exist anywhere, he couldn't find him anywhere. So, actually. The father, the search for his father, he is a symbol. The father, he's searching for what? Searching for the, for uh, identity, searching for destiny, searching for truth, searching for God, searching for what? It depends on the reader and how you want to interpret it. But he was searching for something that, that existed yet it did not exist, or he could not find it at the end of the novel. He could not find it. Um, and actually, uh, it's also. That no novel, it's uh, it reflects Nagi Mahfuz uh, uh, himself and his character and his personality. He's uh, he, he actually is a graduate of uh, philosophy department in Egypt in the University of Adab, University of Arts. So these philosophical questions always 
uh, engaged uh, Nagi Mahfouz uh, in his writing and always were depicted and, and posed in his writing. In 66 and 70, from 66 to 71, he returned to national themes. Return to national. When we say 66 to 71, we know right away that the political uh, situation at that time was uh, was really uh, fragile, and uh, and uh, because of the war in in 67, if we may call it war, it's not a war. Huh? If, if we if we follow the philosophy of uh, uh, the French philosopher uh, Baudrillard. Uh, actually, when he said about the Gulf Air, he wrote three articles, the Gulf, War, the Gulf War will not happen, the Gulf War is not happening, the Gulf War did not happen. And what he said that we did not see two arms meeting each other, fighting each other. Uh, we only saw some bombardments going on on the TV s screen. And so the war in 67, we have to put the word war in brackets actually or in quotation marks because because it was not a real war there were no two armies meeting each other it, the, the loss here happened because of treason because of uh, uh, stupidity of the of the of the uh, the, the military uh, head uh, the, the head of the military egyptian military and the president himself Anyhow, so th th uh, during that time, from 66 to 71, he published the first, his first novel, Adrift on the Nile, Tharthara Fawqan Nil. And this novel depicts the Egyptian society in the mid-60s and, uh, and how uh, opportunism and disillusionment uh, prevailed in the society. And what that was like Nagib Mahfouz's prophecy of the coming loss even before it happened and it, the, the loss happened a few months later um, unfortunately then uh, another novel in 67 he published his Miramar Miramar is a uh, name of a guest house in Alexandria that still existed until now and, and it's owned by an, an elderly Greek lady called Mariana and the guest house is inhabited inhabited by different uh, people who represent the Egyptian society. They came from different walks of life, and uh, the novel is divided into five parts, and each part is narrated by a different uh, character, narrating the same events but from their perspective, from his or her perspective. Um, in seventy one, he published the mirrors, the Mir al Maraya. And it divided alphabetically into chapters, and each chapter deals with a certain character in Nagi Mahfouz's life. And the novel again covers the social and political development uh, of Egypt in the first half of the 20th century. But uh, unlike Cairo trilogy, Mahfouz is, uh, adopts a modernist style uh, in writing it. Uh, in 77, he returned to universal uh, themes and uh, again depicting uh, pre-modern Egypt, not modern Egypt, but the, the narrative is modernist narrative uh, and in his novel Al-Harafish, published in 77, and it's a collection of uh, tales set in old Cairo uh, in which Mahfouz, I quote Edward Said saying, uh, Mahfouz translated the absolute into history character, event, temporal, sequence, and place. And it, uh, we can see that in each uh, tale, there is always this uh, conflict between good and, uh, and evil, and the triumph of good in the end, and the triumph of law, and the triumph of uh, modernity over the, 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 the pre-modern way of, in, uh, of living in Egypt. Uh, like uh, like depending on power instead of respecting uh, the law, for example. In eighty five, he published his Al Aish fil Hakika, Akhnaton Dwella in Truth. In eighty five, and the the theme of the novel again is universal theme, even though the 
the novel is set in ancient Egypt so here he returns to write about ancient uh, Egypt and uh, the writing mode the narrative is modernist uh, narrative and uh, uh, Akhenaton here even though this he is the main character of course we know Akhenaton is the the Egyptian king or prophet who called his people to uh, to worship uh, the sun the, the the sun was a representation of God the only one God and instead instead of the old gods they worship so turn them from worship worshiping Amun to worship Aton so he he was that's why he was called Akhenaton and uh, the story starts with somebody t trying to uh, ask people about Akhenaton asking so many people about Akhenaton and everyone gave him a, a different description of Akhenaton um, telling him a diff different opinion about Akhenaton uh, and Akhenaton himself did not appear in the novel so Akhenaton here is like the truth we all have different versions uh, and different opinions about the truth uh, and who knows who uh, is right and who is wrong so uh, it, it reminds me of personally it's of uh, Rumi's tale that uh, about the four blind people touching different parts of the elephant and each one of them gave a different description of the elephant uh, so let me conclude here uh, my talk about Nagi Mahfouz and how his writing moved from national themes to universal themes and how his literature moved from uh, national literature to become world literature. In terms of setting and themes, he started uh, uh, by writing novels set in ancient Egypt, uh, depicting the history of ancient Egypt for example Thebes struggle and then he moved to write about and describe modern Egypt the history of modern Egypt for example Cairo trilogy and Miramar and so on uh, in terms of writing mode he started with the historical realist narrative then to socialist the social realist narrative then the modernist narrative as I explained throughout the, the lecture uh, about the universal themes he started with uh, novels set in ancient Egypt as I said like uh, th th in 85 when he later on moved from being or from writing on national themes to writing on universal themes when he wrote about ancient Egypt in 85 he didn't write about it as uh, in historical uh, realist narrative no he wrote about it in modernist narrative and uh, like for example the dweller in truth al-aish fil haqiqa he's talking about the relative truth the relativity of truth and then he also wrote about modern egypt like the search at tariq a person in search of his father without finding him a person in search of the truth without find, finding the truth so uh, it's a, again it's set in modern Egypt but the mode of writing is modernist uh, narrative this is how when we uh, go through the writings of Nagib Mahfouz we see how he moved in terms of uh, themes in terms of uh, setting and writing mode how he moved from uh, being national into universal and how he moved from his literature moved from national literature to be considered world uh, literature uh, this is the end of part two part three we'll talk about Mahmoud Darwish the Palestinian poet I'll give you a break now and I will see you soon in part three hello everybody this is part three uh, of our talk and uh, we'll focus in this part three on Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian poet who was born in the on the 13th of March 1941 and passed away on the 9th of August 2008. Mahmoud Darwish say, says, I quote, There is on this land what makes life worth living. Uh, and he was the national poet uh, of Palestine and he was called the poet of the resistance if we try the same way as what we did with Nagi Mahfouz try to follow the writing career of 
Darwish and uh, divided into phases. I would say that I would divide his uh, his career, his writing into different phases. First, when he was in his twenties, and then starting from 1964, then in 1988 when he, in his forties, and then in 2000 in his fifties, then in his 60s 2002 and 6 and so on so i would uh, divide it into four parts or let us say, say three parts his writing in his 20s his writing in his 40s and his writing in his 50s and 60s in his 20s when he was still young full of energy his writing was uh, or, or his writing has this uh, tone of defiance and anger and he used the clear and direct language because he was addressing his people he was addressing all his people so he had to use direct simple clear language simple diction lyrical language lyrical language uh, like his identity card for example a poem and his, another poem about human being and another a third poem to the reader and so on uh, in his 40s his main topics were being in uh, in exile because he was exiled in his 40s and so he lost his identities he lost his identities and uh, he returned to the same tone of anger during the the invasion of lebanon uh, and also during the first uh, intifada uprising uh, and the third thing we notice in during that phase of uh, phase in his life that he was addressing or he addressed the human side of his enemy in some of his poems for example his poem uh, Beirut and another poem the Adam of two Edens in his 60s the third part the final part of his uh, life he turned mystical his writing style turned mystical and experimental in terms of language and images for example his poem uh, mural and also a state of siege and he started writing about love about life uh, death about daily life uh, experience in a lyrical tone he never abandoned abandoned the lyrical tone and lyrical rhythm but this time in natural speech still lyrical but in natural speech like uh, his writing in the the butterflies effect with some of them uh, prose uh, poems uh, he didn't call them prose uh, poems but still uh, lyrical in their essence he 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 could not abandon the this lyrical element this beautiful lyrical element in his uh, writing i now i give you some examples uh, in his 20s when he was young let us read for example his identity card betakat hawiya he says look at the words pay attention to the words i mark in red look at the vocabulary what kind of vocabulary he used at the time he says write down i am an arab he stole the groves of my forefathers and the land i used to till you left me nothing but these rocks and from them i must rest a loaf of bread for my eight children write down on the top of the first page i do not hate people i steal from no one however if i am hungry i will eat the flesh of my usurper beware beware of my hunger and of my anger we we can see and feel his passion we can feel his anger in the in the in the, the lyrical this is even in english it sounds lyrical imagine it's in arabic in arabic it's so lyrical so powerful and the, look at the words stall rocks eat us usurba hunger anger this kind of language very simple very direct very powerful it conveys his angry feeling very clearly right away another uh, poem about a human being published in 64 actually uh, also identity card was published in 64 and <clears throat> when it was published it uh, gained him uh, fame right away in the in the arab world he was famous right away in the arab world he was uh, born as i said in 41 so 64 that means he was 23 years old and he was so famous right away uh, all over the arab world 
the other poem about a human being again pay attention to the words in red they fettered his mouth with chains and tied his hands to the rocks of the dead they said you're a murderer they took his food his clothes and his banners and threw him into the well of the dead they said you're a thief they threw him out of every port and took away his young beloved and then they said you are a refugee uh, look at the word fettered, chains, rock, dead, murderer, dead, thief, refugee. All these words convey clearly his passion, his powerful feelings, his anger, his frustration, uh, his revolutionary spirit uh, at the time. Uh, to the reader, another poem, he says, The wrath of my hands, the wrath of my mouth, and the blood of my veins is a sap of wrath. Oh, very powerful, very powerful and full of wrath and anger. Uh, in his 40s, when he was exiled all over the world, he wrote in Adam of Two Edens, We brought you tidings of innocence and daisies, but you have your God and we have ours. Now we notice the shift in the language, in the vocabulary, in the diction. Now after talking or writing, using vocabulary like chains, anger, wrath, hunger, rocks, now he's using innocence, daisies, and now he's addressing his enemy. He's addressing his enemy saying, we brought you tidings of innocence and daisies, but you have your God and we have ours. Now he's addressing the human side uh, in his enemies. In uh, Ode to Beirut, he says, Streets encircle us as we walk among the bones. Are you used to death? He's addressing his enemy, okay? Streets encircle us as we walk among the bones. Are you used to death? I'm used to life. And to, the, and to endless des desire. Do you know the dead? I know the ones in love. Again, he's, he, he now he's uh, projecting the dichotomy between life and death. He prefers, he and his people prefer life while his enemy prefers death. Uh, and we can see from the language used, he's talking to his enemy again. Are you used to death? I'm used to life. Can you see, can you see, can you feel the shift in, in, the, in his attitude towards his uh, enemy? It's not, not only about being angry and, and willing to eat the flesh of his uh, usurper, but now he's addressing the human side of his, his, so, of his enemy. So we can feel that Ma'am Darwish here is getting mature and uh, addressing the human side of his, in his enemy. And uh, another poem, we travel like other people. He says, we, tra we travel like other people, but we return to nowhere. This is wonderful. Mahmoud Darwish was so excellent, really, in, uh, in saying words, usual words, like ordinary words used by ordinary people, ordinary expressions, but he ends them with something that shocks you as a reader. Like, we travel like other people, and look at like other people, like other people, uh, as other people travel. Look at this like other people. Again, he's trying to, to show the reader that they are humans too, like other people, humanizing themselves as victims. But the difference between other people and them, Palestinians, is that, but we return to nowhere. While you return, you travel and you return to your home in the end, they travel but they return to nowhere. Perfect, perfect. Athens airport, he says, Athens airport changes its people every day, but we have stayed put waiting for the sea. <laughs> Seems there is no traveling by air to them. In this picture with Edward Said. In his late 50s, now he turned mystical, experimental, and tried to talk about, and we can see clearly his writing changed completely. The language changed, the themes changed. Uh, now he's mystical, experimental, the, the topics are universal topics, like this poem, Mural, Jidariya. He says, this is your name, a woman said, 
and vanished through the winding corridor. There I see heaven within reach. The wing of a white dove carries me towards another childhood. And I never dreamt that I was dreaming. Everything is real. I knew I was casting myself aside and flew. I shall become what I will in the final sphere. And everything is white, the sea suspended upon a roof of white clouds, nothingness is white in the white heaven of the absolute. I was and was not. In this eternity's white regions, I am alone. I came before I was due. He, in this poem, he, he said that he dreamt of death, of being dead. And uh, look at the, the language. I see heaven. Now is, there is no more talking about uh, anger, wrath, all of the Heaven, a white dove, childhood, white heaven, absolute. I was and was not uh, very mystical. The language is mystical, is obscure sometimes in this eternity. So it's the topic here is not anymore about Palestine, about his national cause, about his land. No. It's, it's a universal, it's about death and what we shall see after death, a topic that can be shared and felt by anybody around the world. Uh, in the same poem, th says, he says, there is no age sufficient for me to pull my end to the beginning. You, we can see this always, this, he, he, he likes to use this dichotomy and the uh, in the dichotomy of meanings like end and beginning and as for me now that i am filled with all the possible reasons for departure i am not mine i am not mine i am not mine departure here death is f full of, filled with all the possible reasons for for departure from this life i am not mine in his 60s he continued in this, his way of writing, his mode of writing, continued in this mystical, universal, and the rhythm of natural speech in uh, a state of uh, siege, Halit Hisar. He says, A woman said to the clouds, Please, enfold my loved one. My clothes are soaked with his blood. If you shall not be rain, my love, be trees, saturated with fertility, be trees. And if you shall not be trees, my love, be a stone, saturated with humidity, be a stone. And if you shall not be a stone, my love, be a moon, in the loved one's dream, in the loved one's dream, be a moon. So said a woman to her son in his funeral. Very touching poem. Uh, he wrote it, uh, State of Siege, uh, during the... The, the, the siege of uh, the Israeli uh, troops on Jenin camps, Jenin camp in 2002, yeah, 2002. Uh, during the siege, the same poem, during the siege, time becomes a space that has hardened in its eternity. During the siege, space becomes a time that's late for its yesterday and tomorrow. Uh, it's very clear that his writing style completely changed and uh, now his, his writing is full of thoughts, not just feeling, not just passion, not just anger, but uh, reflections, uh, thoughts, I, uh, um, mystical ideas, a mystical language that we'll have to think when we read him, we'll have to think, but I don't mean uh, mystical that's so uh, obscure. It's not that obscure. It's clear what he says is still clear, but uh, it's, it, it has a touch of uh, mysticism in it. In the same poem, we do what prisoners do and what the jobless do. We cultivate hope. And this is what I mean that Darwish uses what is usual? What is ordinary? Using ordinary language. Everybody is using. But he ends it with something shocking, something new, unexpected. Like, we do what prisoners do. Any poet would say that. It's, it's, there's nothing genius about it. 
and, wh and what the jobless do. Again, we cultivate hope. The word hope here <laughs> is really, this is Darwish. This is what makes him different from any ordinary poets. I name the pebbles wings. I name the birds almond and figs. I name the ribs trees. Gently I pull a branch from the fig tree of my breast. I throw it like a stone to blow up the conqueror's tank. So, poem to the land. So we can see the language he changed. Wings, birds, almonds, figs, trees, branch, fig. So uh, beautiful vocabulary, peaceful vocabulary, but he still, he did not give up his revolutionary spirit. He did not, he never give up his revolutionary spirit, but, but the resistance, the way of resistance has changed here. He is not resisting by just throwing stones and shouting and being angry, but he's using even the, the birds, the birds, almond and, uh, he named birds, almond and figs. I name ribs, trees. Gently I pull a branch from the fig tree of my breast. I throw it like a stone to blow up the conqueror's tanks. Uh, he never gave up his revolutionary uh, spirit, but the way of expressing it changed, the, the language changed, and uh, now he's full of wisdom. And it's really a pity that he passed away so early, because I think during that time he reached his maturity as a poet. In his 60s, he reached his maturity as a poet, as a real, universal, world-class poet. So um, it, 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 it's really a pity that he passed away uh, so young, in his 60s. So Darwish, in his 20s, to sum up what I've just said, he focused on national themes. In his 40s, again, national themes. In his 60s, he turned to talk about universal ideas, about love, about life, about death. And he started even to write some love poems, very touching, very beautiful. Uh, the language changed when in his 20s, there was always very clear a tone of the defiance. There is anger. The language so clear, so simple, so lyrical. Uh, in his 40s, when he was in exile, um, He's, he used the same tone of, of anger, uh, but he started addressing the human side uh, of his enemy. In his 60s, the final phase of his life, he turned mystical and his language turned uh, experimental. And uh, he moved from talking only about national themes to talk about universal themes uh, and about love, life, daily experience and so on but he kept this his lyrical tone and uh, but he delivered it in this uh, natural rhythm of speech uh, uh, that's the end of part three of what i want to say about darwish uh, briefly of course darwish is a great poet and there are a lot of things that we can say about him so um, mahfuz darwish mahfuz <laughs> nagib mahfuz Mahfuz and Darwish. To sum up and end our talk, uh, in Cairo trilogy, he used national theme. And in most of his writing, he talked about national themes, national topics, and gained national uh, fame. And uh, in Children of the Alley, he talked about a universal theme, about the creation, about uh, the, the, the history of the world, history of religions. He got Nobel Prize, he became, and he gained universal uh, fame. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, actually, Nobel Prize, yes, gave him uh, a world fame, universal fame, but he deserves, I think Nobel Prize deserves Nagib Mahfouz more than Nagib Mahfouz deserves Nobel Prize. Darwish also, he deserved Nobel Prize. He deserved, it's pity that he didn't gain it. He didn't win it. At the beginning, all his themes, national themes, poems of resistance, and so on, he was called the National Poet of Palestine. And then he turned, he gained, through these national themes, he gained universal fame. 
seem like they're like mahfuz, Nakim mahfuz. From national themes, he gained universal fame. And uh, from the universal themes he addressed, he gained his reputation as a universal uh, poet. So this is what I want to say about these uh, two giants in uh, novel writing and in poetry writing, Nagi Mahfouz and Darwish, Mahmoud Darwish, and how they, the writing changed from being national literature to become world literature. And uh, I uh, end my uh, lecture here. I hope it's uh, it's useful to anybody who's interested in Arabic literature or in world literature in, uh, in general. And I will uh, talk to you later uh, about a new topic. Until then, uh, stay safe and uh, see you. Bye-bye, everybody.